uh, how everybody has to give and take to see how things work. Uh, so even if there was a meeting tomorrow, there's at a, at a town council meeting. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? My name is Tim Thompson. I'm at uh, Six Pine Ridge Road, and uh, I'm here with the same concern that Mr. Perry has on this wetlands ordinance. And one of the early concerns that we expressed about this was the possibility that there would be some delay in getting something workable in place. And I do still have a concern about the number of uh, developments uh, and lots that are currently being presented and considered in front of our planning board. I think the planning board has got as much problem in trying to deal with this wetlands issue as our code enforcement officers. And they, they I don't know, I, I think uh, they have a real problem in trying to address what's being presented before them today with concerns about how it impacts not only the comprehensive plan that we have in, in force, but the one that you're going to consider accepting tonight. And I think uh, some consideration should be renewed for the request that we made some months ago, 190 of us uh, in Cape Elizabeth, requesting that a moratorium should be considered. More, there are precedent in this state for moratoriums for this kind of consideration. And if your final end result uh, is being impacted by, uh, again, some activity that's, I think, taking place to get in underneath this wetlands ordinance, I think you have due uh, uh, ammunition to look at considering a, a moratorium uh, if this is going to continue to drag on uh, before we get a solution or a, an enforceable ordinance. Thank you. Did you have your hand up? Oh. Anybody else got any comment? Any other item that is not on the agenda that you wish to speak? Okay, thank you. Next item is reports and correspondence. Anybody in the council got anything here they'd like to report? I have a couple of things that I would like to report. That uh, we have a council member, Wayne Creelman, has been appointed to the Human Development Steering Committee for the National League of Cities. And uh, it's a great honor to be able to be appointed to one of them committees because it is a highly recognized committee and I want to congratulate Councilor Creeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also, it is a pleasure to let you know that our town manager has been appointed to the Trans Transportation and Communications Policy Committee of the National League of Cities. And uh, it indeed is a great honor for me to commend you for being involved there, Mr. McGovern. They, it takes up some time and it takes up a great, great amount of time at times. So, And uh, to be recognized in that capacity, I think it's uh, worth being mentioned. So the, nobody else has any comments or we'll move on to, yes, go ahead. I just wanted to give the council a brief overview of what I did a week ago Sunday during the snowstorm. <laughs> I finally took the opportunity to ride in the snowplow and have a new appreciation for the work that our public's, public works employees do. It can be very repetitious and somewhat tedious. But three hours, it was really fascinating. I enjoyed the opportunity to do it, and I thank Bob Malley and his public works crew. Was you officially a wingman? I was a wing person. <laughs> <laughs> Wing did, you, did you operate the levers? They put me in the western side of town where there wasn't too much to hit, so I oh. did pretty well, I think. <laughs> Very didn't good. break anything. No mailbox? I was careful with mail orders. Okay, <laughs> next on the agenda is a public hearing on one smirk avenue, an unsafe structure. And uh, I don't know if any of you have gone by it, but it is a unsafe structure as I see it, and I believe the town recognizes it at that. And before I open it up to the, to the public, I think I'll uh, have Ernie McVean, the code enforcement officer, give us kind of a brief outlay of what's there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Um, 
to bring you up to date on the property, on October 18th of 89, we notified the owners of the property and requested that they secure the building. On October 23rd, uh, a fire destroyed the building and after inspections by our department, the owners were notified November 6th and, and were informed that we considered, that I considered the building to be unsafe, that they were to remove the foundation and all the debris. Um, the owners were not very re responsible or responsive to our request and on November 20th, I requested the town manager to bring this matter before you so that we can proceed with an unsafe structure, um, a, a nuisance, and, and resolve this matter. And if there's any questions, I also have, I'll be with you, some pictures that were taken by the uh, public safety department. That's all you have, sir? Excuse me? Anything else you want to add to it? I have nothing else. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Okay. Is anybody from the public care to speak in favor? Anybody in opposition? <coughs> Nobody's too concerned about it, but the town <laughs> or the neighbors. Oh, come forward, sir. <coughs> Hi, my name's David Witten, and I'm the son of the owner of the uh, property at One Sperwink Avenue. Uh, me and my brother and sister own the adjacent or abutting land behind it. Um, and I think that the responsibility of uh, trying to secure the property was um, kind of tried to be laid on us uh, as far as trying to secure it. My father lives in Florida. Um, I don't think he's financially able enough to fly up here and secure the building. Um, it is in kind of a litigation process right now as to who the exact owner of the property is. Um, the I know the notice of hearing that I've got um, to come to this meeting had a list of all the people who were involved or basically who are, you know, involved in the property itself. And I don't see any of the other, you know, people here to speak their word for it, but uh, I, I don't know what the right, uh, you know, uh, answer is to the problem. I do agree that it is an unsafe structure and something should be done with it, um, but as to who is responsible uh, for paying for that or taking it into their own hands to doing that, I am unsure as to who is the responsible party for it. Um, so I, I, I really don't know what the next step is to, to, to fix the problem. Um, but I just thought, you know, I wanted to tell you guys that, you know, that it is up in litigation as to who is the actual owners and uh, no one else showed up but me, so <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, but I just thought I'd say that. Thank you. Thank you. With the man at least a, a facsimile copy of one uh, from the town attorney and the original will be coming tomorrow but I would like to uh, have entered into the record of the clerk uh, indicating the notices that that were uh, were provided uh, for this hearing uh, and the town attorney goes on in some detail as to how the notices were presented uh, if the council does adopt the unsafe structure declaration it would, in essence, then become the responsibility of the town uh, to take the to take the necessary corrective actions. Uh, the town would keep track of uh, the expenses uh, for securing uh, the property, and the lien would be placed uh, on the property for the amount of the cost that's uh, pursuant to the state statute uh, governing uh, declarations of unsafe structures. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. I would like to know what the state statute definition of a nuisance is. Do we have that? Had it with me last month. Uh, 
it's, I, could, I could go up and get a no, copy, but it's quite, it's not that important. It's quite involved. I just wanted to make sure that all, mm -hmm. I would assume that all of our wording corresponds to I mean, I could come up with a definition of what's in here. I mm -hmm. wanted to see how accurate. It, it, was, it was reviewed uh, okay. closely following the state statute. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Not. We'll close the public hearing part of it and move on to item 124 to consider the declaration of a structure at one spark Avenue and an unsafe as a nuisance and taking necessary action. And before we do that, I want to apologize for my problem here a little bit. I forgot to cement my bottom teeth in before I left home, so they're bouncing around a little bit on me, but I'll do the best I can. So I'm asking the town clerk to, to read the order, if she would. I want to be honest with you. Order, this matter came before the town council of the town of Cape Elizabeth, pursuant to a request by the building inspector that the structure and immediately surrounding area owned by Great Southern Development Corporation and located at 1 Spurwink Avenue in the town of Cape Elizabeth be determined to be a nuisance pursuant to Title 17 in the main, sta main revised statutes annotated Section 2851 and for an appropriate order to follow. A hearing on this matter was scheduled for February 12, 1990 at the town hall. The appropriate notices of the hearing were provided to the owner and to the parties in interest as they appeared in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds by either personal service, certified mail, or publication in the Portland Press Herald on January 17th, January 24th, and January 31st, 1990. A hearing was held at 7.30 p.m. on February 12th, 1990. Both oral testimony and written statements were introduced as evidence from the various witnesses appearing. Upon review of the appropriate state statute and after consideration of the testimony, written statements, and other evidence submitted at the hearing, the Town Council hereby determines that a nuisance does exist at the premises at 1 Spurwink Avenue in the town of Cape Elizabeth and hereby adopts the following findings of fact. A, that the area immediately surrounding the building is dangerous to life and property by virtue of fire debris, nails, broken glass, protruding timbers, and unsafe structural foundation walls. B, that the structure consisting of an open three sides foundation of a burnt dwelling is dangerous to life and property due to unsafe leaning structural foundation walls. C, that the structure is unfit for occupancy due to the above conditions. And D, that the structure and surrounding area constitutes a hazard to health and safety for the above reasons. The above described nuisance is hereby ordered to be removed and abated, which removal and abatement shall include the following. A, there shall be no occupancy of the structure or surrounding premises for residential use or otherwise until a certificate of occupancy is issued. B, all debris from within and around the foundation structure and all dangerous conditions including fire debris, nails, broken glass and protruding timbers shall be immediately removed by the owner and properly disposed of. C, that foundation walls shall either be secured to the satisfaction of the building inspector or shall be torn down and properly disposed of. D, in the event that the owner does not comply with the above paragraphs during the 30-day statutory appeal period provided by Title 17 of the Main Revised Statutes Annotated, Section 2853, the building inspector is directed to take all necessary steps to remove and abate the nuisance as described above. E, all expenses incurred by the town in connection with this proceeding to determine a nuisance and incurred in the abatement or removal of the nuisance found to exist shall be demanded of the record owner, Great Southern Developed Corporation, and if not paid within 30 days of demand, a special tax shall be assessed in accordance with the provisions of Title 17, May Revised Statutes, Annotated Section 2853. This order shall be recorded by the town clerk, who shall forthwith cause an attested copy to be served upon the owner and all parties and interests in according with Maine state law. Thank you. Has anybody got any comment or anything? Councilor Creamer. I visited this structure yesterday uh, for my second visit. Um, it looked a little better yesterday uh, with a foot of snow on top of it all. But I think the, uh, the, the fact that the foundation walls uh, are so wobbly um, that, you know, any kids that would end up uh, playing around that structure uh, could indeed uh, be under a, a bunch of rubble um, in a very short uh, time. Uh, I think it's a very, very dangerous structure, aside from just the, the eyesore 
as you enter uh, Cape Elizabeth from South Portland. Uh, and I would indeed be in favor uh, of this uh, nuisance uh, story and will indeed uh, vote affirmative uh, on the motion. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Council Matheson. I've, I've gone by it too, and, and I agree it's shameful. And it, it definitely is a detriment to the, prop, the surrounding properties and their values. So I'm going to be voting for it too, but I do have a question. Have the taxes been paid on this property? They usually, uh, I haven't checked recently, but they customarily do run behind. But, but they are paid usually prior to any foreclosure. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Did you have a comment you would like to make right quick? Um, I have a comment as far as the, uh, I agree that the property should be secured, uh, all the debris removed and stuff like that uh, due to it being an unsafe um, uh, option for children to get in there and get hurt and get a nail in their foot and stuff like that. I do agree about that. The foundation walls, I don't have a concern that uh, they are too wobbly. They are, most of them are like 10 inches thick with rebob and they're tied, tied into the uh, foundation itself. Whether they're, uh, you know, last time I was up there, they seem to be pretty sound. My only concern, as an abutting property owner, it is driving my uh, value of my property down also, so I would like to see the whole thing just removed, okay? Um, but with the concern as to the other parties who are involved, you know, all the people who have interest in the property, I do believe that uh, uh, Mr. Cludia was interested in using the existing foundation and walls that were there to rebuild as an option. Um, I don't know. That's just something that uh, I heard through the grapevine, whether he, w he was uh, <coughs> sure on doing that or not, I don't know. Um, but obviously, if you all vote on tearing the whole thing down, then that's, that's what's going to happen. Uh, but I don't have a concern that they are, you know, that the walls are unsafe. That's it. And the taxes usually are paid by my brother due to the fact that my father is having a hard time, but he is the first mortgage holder of the property and does usually pay the taxes. He's a little behind because he's a student and he's had the burden and the responsibility of trying to save it for my father. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else got a comment? Anyone care to make a motion? Councilor Greenlaw. Mr. Chairman, I move that we declare the structure at One Spurling Avenue as unsafe and as a nuisance and take the um, action previously read by Town Clerk. I'll second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Vote six to no. Next item on the agenda is item 117, continued from meeting 108990, held January 22nd, 1990, to consider permitting the use of Fort Williams Park for project graduation and taking necessary action. I believe the manager has this. Do you have yes, a we have oh. three representatives oh. here from uh, the class of 1990, Cape Elizabeth High School, uh, <laughs> uh, who are here at the request of the town council. You all three speaking or just one? <laughs> I'm <Doesn't it> care. <laughs> <laughs> don't be don't be bashful. Step right up to the mic. My name's Kara Rubin. This is Sally Gomard and Kristen Biggis, and we're here on behalf of the class of 1990 to request the use of Fort Williams Park for our graduation ceremony. Um, <clears throat> we, according to our plans, the ceremony will take place um, adjacent to the softball field, um, and. Um, <laughs> On June 15th, 1990, um, it will start in the afternoon around 4 o'clock, continuing till 6 o'clock, um, and we're going to have a formal reception after the, after the actual ceremony. Um, I'd like to specify that it, it's nothing like um, what has occurred there in the past, what has occurred in the fort in the past. It's not um, 
a party kind of um, okay <laughs> um, it's not a party that we're having we're having the actual um, ceremony and a, and a formal reception um, the reception will continue until 7:30, and that is that will be the end of the the events at the at the fort. Um, and that's about it. Are there any questions? Then the party starts after 7:30, Zach. Right. <laughs> no, but it won't be at the fort. So. Yeah. <laughs> anybody? Anybody get a comment? Anybody on the council? Okay. Council Greenlaw. Just so you folks know, and I imagine you've already heard this, that there has been some concern expressed by some of the parties who hope to be involved in Family Fun Day, which is the next morning afternoon on the Saturday the 16th. I am repeatedly assuring everybody that all parties involved are going to work together and you may be contacted by some of the Family Fun Day committee just to follow up on that. <coughs> That's the reason they would be contacting you, just to follow up on that concern. I don't, I don't think there would be any problem with that because we, we will be out of the fort even earlier than than has been in the past, and, and there haven't been any conflicts I don't, that I know of. So um, I, don't, I don't think there'd be a problem. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Thank you. Thanks. You all received a memo in your packet uh, as a request for the graduating class of 1990. And uh, what is your wishes? Do I hear Mr. a motion? Chairman? Yes. Uh, I will move that we grant the request of the class of 1990 for use of Fort Williams Park for their graduation ceremony on June 15, 1990. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Thank you. Item 125, to consider acknowledging Receipt from the report of the Comprehensive Planning Commission take any necessary action. I believe Mrs. Redmond is here to make some comments. Well, I'm here tonight on behalf of the Comprehensive Plan Planning Commission. As you know, we've been working on the Comprehensive Plan for quite a while. It's a state mandate that every town have a comprehensive plan. And Cape Elizabeth last approved a plan in 1981. Our group first met in the fall of 1987, and we've been working on this plan, which I, I think you all have a copy of now, since that time. Um, our group has been comprised <coughs> of members representative of many town groups, the planning board, the zoning board, the school board, and so forth. And I just want to read down the names of everybody who was on the commission. John Ammerling was the chairman, Penny Carson the vice chairman. Other members were Dan Boxer, Larry Clough, Ann Finlayson, Carol Fritz, Ed Hollage, Lynn Jones, Al Martin, Bill Nickerson, and myself. Um, this plan really culminates what we thought was a pretty extensive process. We conducted a community-wide survey. We had meetings with other special committees that were going on at the time. And we had two public hearings. So tonight, what's really happening is we're formally saying to you, here it is. And we're hoping that you're saying to us, yes, we've got it. And then <laughs> just <laughs> for the members of the public, what's going to happen next is that in April, the Comprehensive Planning Commission will be having a workshop with the town council. And we'll be hearing their comments then and, and seeing how exactly it's going to go after this. Thank you. Has anybody got a question or comment? Mrs. Redmond? Yes. Uh, just a comment that uh, the format, I think, is excellent this time around. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, I, I like the fact that uh, the goals have been prioritized. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that I think anybody reading this has a pretty good idea of, of what it is that this town wants to preserve and wants to, wants to do in the next decade. So. I would commend the committee well, on this. That's good. I, I know the first time we showed it to you, it was confusing. It was it pretty was. clear to us. There were because like 100 we were recommendations, involved. <laughs> and it was hard to tell 
Well, you know, which it, it's good important. to have that feedback and to, to come up with something that is clear and that you can read and know what we were thinking because exactly. that was not the case before. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your comments, and I too want to congratulate you from coming up with a document that we can proceed with. I know it's taken quite a while, but when you get a reception like this, you want to feel that time was well worth it. Thank you. You've all, you've all heard your comments from the Planning Commission. And uh, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we acknowledge receipt of the report of the uh, Caplesville Comprehensive Planning Commission uh, and that we uh, plan to workshop with the commission uh, in April at the date that's, I think, already been set and which escapes my memory at this moment. I'll second. second. Anybody else get a comment? <laughs> <laughs> You've heard the motion. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Vote six to nine. <coughs> to consider setting a public hearing on proposed revised sewer rates and taking necessary action. You've you all received a lot of info and a lot of numbers from the manager and uh I believe we have someone here from the Sewer Study Committee. <laughs> He's a reporter today. He's a reporter tonight. He's not speaking, but uh, I take it you've all gone over the schedules and the options that you would like to see worked out and the best and the fairest for everyone. Uh, does the manager have a comment he'd like to make for us? I think this speaks for itself, and hopefully the council could decide among the options and set one for a public hearing for the March 12th meeting. Council Masterson. Um, I have a question for the manager. Michael, these are quarterly payments, right? That On is correct. Two. Thank you. Anybody else? Council Greenland. Um, Mr. Manager, although you give us six options, you seem to lean uh, toward option four, uh, whereby the elderly would be given a break uh, and we would at the same time keep the tax contribution at the uh, current level. Could you just expand on that option for a moment? Yeah, it's, uh, what it does, it, it takes to heart some of the comments that the council made at the last meeting. And that was that could we possibly find a way to give a little bit of a break to, to those who use lower amounts of uh, of water usage and what this would do is uh, change it so that instead of a 1200 cubic feet foot minimum uh, for instead of having a ex let me explain that from the beginning again ex instead of having uh, water usage figured from the first 1200 cubic feet of water usage it'd be figured from the first 900 so therefore you'd gain a little revenue additional revenue between the 900 and the 1200 and with that revenue you can give a break to the people who are using just 900 uh, the other issue that comes into this is what the general fund contribution ought to be. The uh, year or so ago, it was $115,000. The Board of Sewer Appeals recommended that it go to, uh, it, and subsequent to that, it went to $100,000. They recommended that it go back to $115,000. Uh, while from uh, you know, a policy point of view, I can certainly understand you know, uh, where their recommendation comes from. Uh, you know, I think that there are very strong arguments to be made for providing a significant general fund contribution uh, towards sewer costs because of all the infiltration in the system and because of the environmental uh, improvements that have come about because of the system. On the other hand, uh, the budget's in really tough shape this year. And uh, we're looking at, at, a, at a sizable tax increase and every thousand dollars, every dollar uh, that can help, uh, you know, will go a long way in, in easing the, the property tax burden. I looked at uh, the budget today and did the revenue side of it, and uh, all of the town revenues for this coming year will be up just 1% in the aggregate. Uh, so when you look at, you know, some of the other increases we've been looking at, uh, we're in really tough shape. The additional revenue, 
according to the numbers I put together for the whole, to support the whole budget are, is only $25,000. Uh, when you, you know, you try to take 15 of that just for this one purpose, uh, it, it really begins to put everyone behind the eight ball. So that, that is why I, I come down to, uh, to option four, and, uh, particularly the $100,000 general fund contribution. And with option four, basically, what is the percentage of the uh, individuals in the Cape who, who pay on the sewer that would be included in the, the bottom line of the 900 cubic feet? The 8490 per quarter? Yeah. Uh, I don't have the exact amount with me, but uh, my recollection is it's uh, between a third and half. Anybody else got a comment? Councilor Greenlaw. I thank the manager for making some good sense out of the convoluted motion I tried to make on this item in the last meeting. What is, has been presented to us is what I needed to see. I do have some questions. I need to know if we're still, well, you've answered that one. Um, does each of these options you presented us generate about the same amount of revenue, as far as you can tell? I know some of them are a little iffy. They, some of them are a little more iffy because it's tougher to guess, but mm -hmm. it's, they're all predicated on the, in the aggregate of bringing in about an extra 7%. Okay. 6%, excuse me. An extra 6%. And we were looking for 7.2% last count. It, it's between 6 and 7. I've, I've noted a little bit of uh, improvement, <coughs> particularly from the district on their last billing as uh, more, uh, more bills being issued. Not more bills being issued, but a, a little higher usage level than uh, we had a year ago. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in hearing you say that a third to half of our citizens on sewer would fall at the, whatever, if we set the 900 cubic feet as the base, would fall at or below that base. I did a very unscientific survey of people I know who are on sewer and even two-person family was above that usage. But I'm glad to hear that, and I'm still very much in favor of using the 900 cubic feet as the base rather than the 1,200 cubic feet. I think we're being much fairer to our citizens if we do that. I'm also very much in favor of the $100,000 general fund contribution as opposed to the $115,000 thousand dollar general fund contribution for the reasons you're giving this evening. I don't think that our budget can stand the hundred fifteen thousand dollar contribution. I know that's making a budget policy decision this evening, but that's one that I'm comfortable with making. Thank you. Anybody else? For the people out there, I'll try to read what option four is and I presume there'll be a motion to that effect. $84.90 for the first 900 cubic feet, $2.30 each additional 100 cubic feet, then $100,000 from the general fund. Users cost at 3,000 cubic feet is $133.20. User cost at 2,000 cubic feet is $110.20. So get the people out there an idea of what the change is. I have a question, maybe uh, you answered it a little bit, but it didn't. By going from 1,200 down to 900, how many do you feel that would affect? Or do you not have any idea? I, I don't have those numbers in, in front of me, but uh, of, of those that are in that range, my, my recollection is it's around 10% uh, of the users. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Are you ready for a motion? Yes, I am. Council Matheson. I move that we adopt um, option four uh, as our new sewer fee. I'll I'll hear second. a second. We have to set, set a public, public hearing, hearing. Set for next month. Public hearing for next month. Oh. For, for that fee. For that oh. option. All right. I move that we set a public hearing on op option number four as a sewer fee for the next regular meeting of the town council. I'll second. 7.30, town hall, all that jazz. All in favor of the motion, 
Please raise your hand. Those opposed? So vote. Item 127, to consider a report from the Appointments Committee regarding vacancies on town boards, commissions, and committees, and on other appointments taking necessary action. And I believe that is turned over to Councilor Greenlaw, the Chairman of the Appointments Committee. How's Thank that? Very nice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Appointments Committee has worked probably longer and harder than they have in past years. We had a wonderful and an enthusiastic outpouring of volunteer interest in our call for volunteers to serve on the town's boards and commissions. In the course of six evenings, we met with 65 citizens, and we'll be presenting tonight recommendations for 42 placements on town boards and commissions. Thirteen of those placements are reappointments to the current position that people are in already. Just so everybody understands, most of the boards and commissions we are talking about serve three-year terms, and <coughs> it's been a general town policy that if you're on a board of commission and elect, you may elect to serve for two consecutive terms, after which time you must take one year off from that particular board of commission before asking to be reappointed. We did have a number of situations, those 13 I mentioned, that are reappointments, people who are already serving in one capacity or another who want to continue for their next term. Before I go into the names of the people we are putting before the council this evening, I would like to go over the memorandum that was presented to you by the Appointments Committee. And this proposes to make amendments to three sections of the ordinance dealing with boards and commissions. The first of these would be our request to consider changing the length of term of planning board members and conservation commission members. When these two, when this board and this commission were established, there were state requirements that members serve for five years. We would like the council to consider three-year terms for the full members on the planning board and for all members on the conservation commission. We find we are experiencing what's commonly known as burnout among some members. If you are appointed to one of those positions and you want to serve for your second term, you are looking at 10 years. It could be longer if you've been an associate on the planning board. One of our favorite jokes from Council Latore, who unfortunately is not here tonight, was that that was half of his lifetime, so it seemed like a very long period of time to be facing. We do stretch the truth a bit. <laughs> That did impress some of our interviewees. When we were talking with people who were asked, asking to be appointed to Planning Board and Conservation Commission, we brought up the possibility that these terms would be changed in their duration. And I think to a person, we found a great sense of relief from the volunteers coming forth, saying that that certainly seemed all right to them, would be more acceptable if they had that choice, perhaps. So if we would like to consider those, um, we would, I would ask that we'd set to a public hearing the two ordinance sections dealing with the length of terms of the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission, and would hope that we would be able to say that people being appointed this year to those positions would come under the shortened duration of serving. The other situation we ran into was just delightful, <laughs> as were all of them was with our Board of Health. And this is a board that I somewhat took under my wing last year. It was a board that the council expressed an interest in seeing revived and reju rejuvenated and becoming more active. And I did attend two of their meetings within the past year. I know that they did come up with more activities than they had in the past. We're very interested in them becoming a proactive board, not waiting for an emergency situation, but being very active within the community. We found we had a number of people asking to be appointed to that board. It gets embarrassing when you sit there and say, we love your enthusiasm and your interest, we have no openings. We found some very dedicated people this year who would like to be on that board, feel that the board can maintain 
a level of five members, which is what we would ask you to consider, rather than the current three member. And if it's the council's wish, we could set that also to public hearing at the next meeting. Mr. Chairman. Council Mess. Sh shouldn't, I don't have any objections to these at all, but shouldn't, procedurally, shouldn't these be referred to the ordinance committee? Well, and you could make the appointments for three-year terms and the five-member um, Board of Health pending action by the Ordinance Committee and the Council. We can do that. that oh, well, I, I don't know. Let's ask the manager. This within the ordinance, whether this change in the appointment should go back to the Ordinance Committee. I'll go to the Ordinance Committee and I'll back to them. Or it, it's can up we to do it just by uh, having a public hearing? It's, it's up to the council to determine what it wants to send to one of its committees. There's, there's no absolute requirement that something be, be referred. It's traditional. And it's, it's really up to the council. Well, as chair of the ordinance committee, I would move to accept these three recommendations from the uh, bench tonight uh, for both the Board of Health, the uh, Planning Board, and the Conservation Commission, unless there was great disagreement among my members of the ordinance I committee. I would second it. As I said before, I don't have any objections, but I just Proceed didn't want us to do anything illegal. Well, I think uh, the way this should be handled is item 127 refers to the appointments. If you'd like to bring an item up on order at the end of the agenda to do that, okay. that's the way I think it should be handled, and there would be a separate item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, would you like me to do item 127? <laughs> well, we don't have a shot me. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I would like to propose to the council the following volunteers to serve on our boards and commissions. I will give you their name, the person they are replacing, if that's appropriate, and the date that their term will expire. I want to do that because we have some appointments recommended appointments who are filling out terms. I want to make sure that I have it as clean as possible. For Area Development Council, Carla Nixon to be reappointed, expiring March 1, 91. For Planning Board, to replace Dan Boxer, Janet McKay, to serve until 3-1-93. That would be a three-year term rather than a five-year term. On planning board to repl to finish the unexpired term of Alice Rand would be Judith Kane, who most of you may know as Judith Wyman, to finish Alice Rand's term, which expires 3193. For planning board to fill the unexpired term of Marion Guthrie, we propose Stephen Edsel, term to expire 3194. For Planning Board Associates, to replace Judith Wyman, Thomas Emery, term to expire 3191. Planning Board Associate to replace Stephen Etzel, Gilman Angier Jr., term to expire 3191. Zoning Board to replace Robert Hershon, Nancy Sanger, term to expire 3193. Zoning Board Associate, Robert Cronin reappointed term to expire 3191. Zoning Board Associate to replace Nancy Singer, Michael Crowley, term to expire 3191. Board of Health, Dr. Owen Pickus to be reappointed, term to expire 3193. <coughs> Conservation Commission <coughs> to replace Sally Tinsman, Patrick Carroll, term to expire 3193. That would be a change to a three-year term. Conservation Commission to replace Frank Strout, Jeanette Hagen, term to expire 3193, again a three year term. Riverside Cemetery Trustees, Wayne Brooking reappointed, expire 3193. <laughs> Thomas Memorial Library Trustees <laughs> to replace Mary Kiernan, Trish Katz, term to expire 3193. Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, Jeffrey Shred reappointed to 3193. Community Services Advisory Board 
to replace Diane Dussault, Jane Greer, term to expire 3193. CATV Advisory Board, John Bates reappointed to 3193. <laughs> Fort Williams Advisory Commission, Randy Weil reappointed to 3193, and Clint Blood reappointed to 3193. Board of Historic Preservation Advisors, replacing Lynn Jones, Ed Capano to 3193, replacing Dorothy LeBlonde, Lucy Follatier to 3193. Replacing Arlene Jordan, Deborah Conley to 3193. Arts Commission, Rhonda Wilson reappointed to 3193. Board of Harbor Commissioners, George Knowles reappointed to 3193. Replacing Janet McKay on Board of Harbor Commissioners, Philip Perino to 3190 turn, 3192. Mm -hmm. He would be filling the unexpired term of Janet McKay and Harbor Commissioners. Board of Sewer Appeals, William Orcutt reappointed, David Bridges reappointed, both of them to serve to 3193, replacing Thomas Forst, Sheila Hillman to 3193, Personnel Appeals Board, Evelyn Cox reappointed to 3193, Family Fun Day, Jan Love to 9193, Hank Kinsley to 9191, Christine Groff to 9192, and Karen Dunphy to 9193. Those are staggered terms. This is the first year the council is making appointments to the Family Fun Day Committee. Um, the Cape Elizabeth representative to prop, replacing Debbie Pizzo. Ernest Loxy to 6191. That is the, to finish out Debbie's unexpired term on the prop board. <coughs> A fair hearing officer for welfare <coughs> cases, replacing Michael McGovern. We propose Barbara Thielen to 3193. For the newly expanded Board of Health, propose Dr. Robert Hillman to 3192 and Margaret Fogg to 3193. Staggered those terms so we do not have an excess of members with their terms expiring in the same year. And a new committee, which we Try not to have too many of, but this is rather an exciting one. This is for the Portland Headlight Keepers Quarters Building Committee. And this was created by the council last month. We're very pleased to put forth the following five names to serve on that committee. Kenny Barthelman, Nancy Harvey, Nancy Jackson, John Houghton, and David Olney. And we look forward to receiving the reports <coughs> from that committee as we do from all of them. And Thank I you. Thank you. Very good report. Anybody got a comment or would you like to put that in the form of a motion? I would be very happy for that to have been a motion, that the council approve the appointments to boards and commissions as presented. Second. Been moved and second. All in favor of the motion? Could, Excuse me. Can we have sorry. Some discussion? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to make a comment that. Uh, we did interview 65 people, as Janet said, and I wish we could have placed all of those people on committees because I'm telling you, we have a wealth of talent that we haven't been able to put on committees. And I hope the people who, uh, we, we all enjoyed meeting, uh, <laughs> will uh, apply again next year if we weren't able to place them this year. Uh, or as we told them during the process, as openings came up during the year, that we would use that pool of people that we've already talked to uh, for replacements. But uh, I think all three of us, uh, Frank, Janet, and I, were so impressed uh, with the people who want to serve in this town. And most people uh, were willing to take any position. Uh, many of them were, said, uh, we'll do anything that you need. We really, f you know, we, we want to play our part, do our part in making this uh, town as great a town as it can be. So, and this went from, uh, uh, very young people who had just moved into town, uh, to retirees, uh, uh, all ages, uh, all interests. It, it, was a, it was a wonderful group of people. Thank you. Very good. Council Greenlaw. One addition, I would like to make some information for people who are newly appointed this evening and for 
our citizens already on town boards and commissions. We will be having an orientation for new board members on Monday night, February 26th, and notices will be going out about that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Cogshaw. I just wanted to ask if there has been any training planned for the new more members of the planning board and the zoning board as to the usual procedures, um, a mock presentations, or has anything like that been scheduled yet? Councilor Greenlaw. I have spoken to Steve Butler, the town planner, who staffs the planning board, and I <laughs> Excuse us. appreciate your concern, especially with three new full members on the planning board and one new full member on the zoning board. Steve assured me that he will be doing more than has been done previously to assist the new planning board members in coming up to speed and understanding their responsibilities. I did talk with at least one other staff person who serves one of the other commissions, and it is our hope to include the town staff people in the orientation meeting this year, which has not previously been done, so that at least the new members will get to see who the staff person is and perhaps understand the opportunity to have rapport with that person and who their contact is. Okay. I think that's a very good point and something we hope to follow through on. Council Emerald. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that too. When we were interviewing people for planning and zoning boards, uh, we did talk with them about uh, the opportunities at the Council of Governments for training sessions, uh, for special uh, uh, seminars on particular subjects uh, okay. that we would expect them to participate in those. Uh, and in fact, one of the members that we did uh, appoint as a, the new, uh, a new full member of the planning board has already been participating in some of those uh, workshops, so we were pleased with that. So that's another <coughs> opportunity for training Good. that is available. Yes, there is. Thank you. Anybody else? There's one thing that I'd like to add is a town planner going to sit down with those three new members and kind of run a quick workshop type deal with them, or is he going to do it, wait until we have an orientation? It was my understanding he was going to do something above and beyond the regular orientation session. Yeah. That everybody participates. Yeah. I'd like to meet with Steve, too, and make sure that that's supplemented fully. I think, you know, to Steve to do it alone, uh, you know, might not be totally appropriate, and it'd be, it'd be nice to have the, the legal point of view there as well. Thank you. You all heard the motion. Do we wish to have a read it again? <laughs> no, thank you. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote, six to nine. Your daughter less, so you haven't got to read it. Item 128, to consider referring to the Ordinance Committee proposed changes to the firearm ordinance and taking necessary action. I believe we have Captain Tolan here from our police department, and I'm wondering, do you have a few words you want to say on that ordinance, or wait until later date? Good job choosing, George. Uh, basically, what we're proposing is to strengthen the ordinance. We ran into a problem this fall with the ordinances at this time prohibit people from discharging firearms in certain areas of the community. However, the way the ordinance is written, someone can hunt an animal with a, with a firearm, and unless we see them discharge it, there's nothing we can do except to warn them about the ordinance. And we're proposing to strengthen this ordinance. Thank you. Anybody got a comment? To Councilor Greenlaw. I've got a question on some of the proposed wording, and maybe you can tell me why it was proposed, and then we can get some feel from the rest of the council. In um, section 9-1-1, the in general, it shall be unlawful for any person or persons to hunt for, pursue, molest, shoot, catch, take, kill, wound, or destroy wild birds or wild animals while armed with a firearm. I'm wondering about the word wild in there. Well, we're looking strictly at uh, wild animals. We're focusing on such things as deer, mm -hmm. bird, uh, I don't think we expected too many people would be pursuing a domesticated animal. Uh, I think there would be other avenues that we could pursue in that criminally, under the criminal code, okay. if somebody pursued a domesticated animal and shot same. Okay, so that is covered elsewhere. Right. Okay, thank you. 
Anybody else? Council Masson. Yes, I had a question about Section 9-1-3. Um, you talk about aqua vegetation. Do you mean wetland vegetation? That's the existing. We have been dealing with a wetland <laughs> ordinance <laughs> for a few years. And I wondered if that was what you were referring to. It's uh, basically the same areas that are allowed right now, such as the Great Pond, the Tidal Marshes, along the Scarborough River, um, below the high tide mark along the coast as long as someone meets all the criteria for hunting. That's what we're talking about. No, I was just referring to the term aqua. Do you mean wetlands? <laughs> Vegetation? Uh, I don't know if you could make it that constricted. It's all wetlands. I think it has to be the appropriate, such as the tidal marsh, the Great Pond area. Uh, if you restricted it to a wetland it's in question as to whether it is a wetland or not. I don't think we can do that. Okay, thank you. That's something I think the audience committee could argue whether you need a wood change there at the time. I, I just Michelle. wanted to ask if the term aqua vegetation is something in state law or something we've had in our own ordinance. I believe it's in our own ordinance at just this time. Just ours, not the state. I'd have to we've, check on that. We've been told there are certain things that are um, regulated by the state and we need Correct. to do it in the same wording Correct. that they have, the state has, so I just wanted to make sure. That would be, uh, Chief and I spoke the other day and obviously at the Ordinance Committee, there might have to be some adjustments to this due to the state laws. And you'll know that in time for the Ordinance Committee meeting? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And Anybody else? Councilor Creelan. The, the areas that are exempted, uh, are we talking, we're talking about a firearm here. Are we talking about shotguns, basically, or any firearm whatsoever? I mean, rifle, pistol, shotgun. You can use a firearm as long as they're in that area. Any firearm. To hunt with. Even a machine gun. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Using. <laughs> Anybody else? I have one more question. Yes, Council Madison. Yes, quickly, um, in your third paragraph on page four, you mention legislation which prohibits the enactment or maintenance of any firearms related ordinance that is more restrictive than state statute. You are talking about state legislation here. And state uh, hunt, hunting and fishing laws, we, we cannot restrict it more than what the state restricts. That's You know, that problems. runs contrary to practically all state law that, that a town can make more restrictive ordinances than the state law. That's what we're saying. We don't believe we can, but we have to clarify this. Some information has come to light since the chief drafted this, and uh, that's what I'm saying. This will have to be adjusted at the ordinance committee. It is more restrictive, and we're not sure that it can be. What is on page two yes. is more restrictive yes. than the state law? Yes, in certain aspects. That should be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And annoying. Does anyone care to make a motion to item 128? I'd uh, move, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that we uh, refer this uh, firearms uh, or the proposed changes to the firearms ordinance to the ordinance uh, committee for our next meeting. I'll second. Been moved and second. Thank you. So. All in favor, raise your hand. I like your smile, Phyllis. To consider a request for a stop sign at the intersection of Salt Spray Lane and Hunts Point Road and take any necessary action. And I believe, are uh, you going to handle this or you want? I'll captain told him. I, I don't th think the captain was, were you informed that you were going to handle this? Or? Okay, I'll, I'll defer to the captain. Regarding this issue, this issue, we had a request from a resident of that area to look at the area and see what we recommended for stop signs. Do they felt that it was a hazardous intersection? Uh, Chief's recommendation would be place a stop sign at the end of Salt Spray Lane where it meets Hunts Point Road. And at the same time, install a uh, white stop line.
far enough back on Salt Spray, Salt Spray Lane to indicate to people to stop back far enough from the intersection. From what I understand, the problem was people turning onto Salt Spray from Hunts Point might tend to take the corner a little sharply. And this is what the problem area was. So we would request a stop sign at Salt Spray. And Hunts Point with a stop line back at a sufficient distance from the intersection. Thank you. Anybody got a question? The cap? Yes, Council Greenlaw. Could you give us some understanding of why no stop sign was proposed on Hunts Point Road as was shown in Mr. Schmader's attachment? Uh, we don't feel that uh, that is necessary or appropriate. You'd have a stop sign in the middle almost of a through street, Hunts Point Road, coming up to the intersection. Uh, we felt that the stop sign at Salt Spray would be sufficient to solve the problem that exists at this time. And I went out and did my little <coughs> tour yesterday and I was <coughs> viewing that in Spurwink Avenue structure. Um, you think it's going to be sufficient to lower the height of those shrubs on that corner? Do you think they might need to be totally taken out? I know that it's on a rise. And the shrubs just add to the height problem down there. I think it would be sufficient to uh, lower them. It might meet the requirements. Do you know if it's been determined whether or not they're in the town right of way? No, it hasn't, I don't believe. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? That was my comment is the shrub and what have you is on the corner there. And when you come up, you really got to have your nose out there in order to see by them. And I think you ought to take a look at that. Your department follow it up and see whether it's on the right of way or it isn't and see what we can do because there is an ordinance to that effect, is it? Is that yes, correct? You know, yes, but regardless, we, we work with the residents. To yeah, I understand that, yeah. but I mean, we do have an ordinance. Yes, we do. Yeah, within so many feet of an instance. Yes. Does anyone care to make a motion? Council Cogshaw. I move that we um, accept the Chief of Police's recommendation to install a stop sign on Salt Spray Lane at the intersection of Hunts Point Road. Second. And, and, and the white line, is that what you want? Okay, that's what and I you was want the white, for, Okay, the I'll amend it to white. include the white line <laughs> as well. I'll amend my second to include the white line. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Excuse oh, excuse me. Before we vote, I'm wondering what kind of notification of anyone out to other residents in this area. I, I'm a little bit uneasy thinking that one resident has bought, brought this forward. We're going ahead and making what will be, for a lot of the people down there on Hunts Point and Winding Way and Maysfield Terrace, a definite change, hopefully, some of the driving habits I've seen. And I'm just wondering what kind of notification went out, or if it's just we've heard from Mr. Schmader, we deal with it, and if there's any repercussions, we hear that after the fact. In the case of stop signs, uh, in the past, we, we have never sent uh, wide notices, and no public hearing has ever been required. And uh, usually we refer it to the police department, and they recommend what they feel is in the, the best interest of public safety. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote, six and a, thank you. For, yes, sir. just to ensure that stop sign and white line are not expected to go up until weather conditions permit and will not be enforced until then. So I just mentioned that so no one would be looking for it in the next week or so. And I would hope maybe there'd be some notification through the Cape Courier that this is gonna happen so people won't be real sequence, <laughs> with all the powers that you have. You don't think <coughs> this evening would stir up anything? Item 130, to consider authorizing the expenditure of up to $4,000 from the Poland Headlight Keepers Quarters Fund for architectural services and take any necessary action. Mr. Manager, you have a comment you would like to make? Everybody received the letter? Comments and what have you? Yes, yes, I will fairly briefly. Uh, the Ad Hoc Architect Selection Committee uh, received about 24 proposals of different firms to provide architectural services. Uh, the committee subsequently interviewed uh, five firms and uh, 
extremely well qualified all five firms. Uh, they recommended that, that Van Dam and Renner uh, be appointed uh, as the architect for this project. Uh, Van Dam and Renner uh, comes to the project very well qualified with, with experience in uh, historic preservation and uh, the feeling of the committee was they had a, a really strong sense of the, the concept and the direction that was approved by the town council uh, last year, a real good sense of uh, what is desired by the community. Uh, another factor in the decision was that the schematic phase uh, was estimated at $3,000. Uh, or not to exceed 3,000, which, uh, which was reasonable compared to the others. I would like to, that was not at all the deciding factor, uh, but, it, but it, <coughs> once the decision was made, it was nice to be able to look back at the numbers and to see that the, the number also fell, fell into place. Uh, you might ask why I'm, I'm asking for an authorization of 4,000 when, it, when it's 3,000. Uh, my experience with uh, these projects before is that you begin to creep into the next phase uh, before, before you come back, uh, there isn't a clear end of the schematic phase, and that's the reason for it. So the plan would be, uh, if you approve the expenditure this evening, is for the, the new building committee appointed this evening uh, to work with this firm and with the project coordinator and myself to develop a, uh, a more complete plan uh, for Portland, the Portland Headlight Keepers Quarters and, and to present it to you in the months ahead. So, thank, thank you. you. Council Coachell. I would like to um, have you ask the, the manager, just for the benefit of the public, to tell us who was on the selection committee. Yes, I'll try to remember. Uh, it was Henry Adams and myself, uh, Nancy Jackson, who is a member of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, uh, John Houghton, uh, who is a former chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and a new member of the building committee, and Richard McGoldrick, uh, uh, who is a resident of uh, Stonegate Road and uh, had had much experience uh, with his own building projects and securing architectural services. Anybody else? Have one? Yes, Council Amro. Um, just one uh, question. And, and looking at the terms and conditions uh, that the architect has given us, uh, I notice as in any of these there's uh, a reference to asbestos. And it just made me wonder, what uh, is do we know whether there is any asbestos uh, in that facility or not? What, what, what do we know about what we're going to run into as far as asbestos concerns? Mm. We, we don't believe that there is any asbestos. Uh, I, I will never say 100% that there isn't any, but there is not believed to be any. Thank you. Do you get down solid by the boiler room? No, even down there it looks pretty clean. I know it looks me. I have one question, one comment. And look at over what there's going to do in some of the recommendations, and I see that you're not going to have any toilet facilities will be provided for the public. Why is that? The, the discussion all along has been that, particularly with the bus traffic, uh, that that would become the, the uh, I was going to use a, an inappropriate <laughs> term. I, I'll use the, the pit stop. <laughs> Uh, That's good. That's good. For all the buses, <laughs> and uh, you know, if that was the case, there'd be there'd be real problems uh, with the current overboard discharge system that the Coast Guard finally got a letter off to the DEP last Friday on, trying to make sure that would continue to be licensed. And once you get into that much higher level of use, uh, you really be begin to get into licensing problems. Not to mention. Uh, trying to keep them clean with, with that level of traffic with the very limited staff we're going to have. And that's the reason for it. And, and not to mention space. There, there just isn't room for them. So we put a privy outside? That's the plan. Yeah. To continue the, the, the privy plan as it now is in, <laughs> is, is in effect. No, I, my thought was when I read it that yeah. looking into the future and what have you that uh, Maybe it should be reconsidered because I would think that uh, what's people going to use it operate it? The, there is going to be a, uh, there will still continue to be uh, two facilities, uh, one for an apartment upstairs and one for uh, an employee. Under OSHA standards, we're required to have one for an employee. Okay, thank you. Council Matheson. Um, I guess I'll ask you this, Michael. Um, 
Are there any plans to have an environmental control system in this building as they do in museums and libraries? That has not been formally discussed. Uh, I'm sure that issue will come out uh, in the discussions between the building committee and the architect. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Greenlaw. I'm curious as to whether or not we, as a council, are being asked to approve the choice of architects. You're being asked to approve the expenditure of funds. Uh, usually the procurement of professional services uh, is left to the manager. Uh, if, you know, if the council wanted to actually make the appointment, I would not object, but customarily those decisions are, particularly for, you know, smaller type projects are uh, left to the manager. Okay. Does anyone care to make a motion that we authorize them to use up to $4,000? Council Greenlaw. Mr. Chairman, I would like to move that the council authorize the expenditure of up to $4,000 from the Portland Headlight Keeper's Quarters funds for architectural services. Do I hear a second? Second. <coughs> Any other comment? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote six to nothing. Item 131, to consider the appointments of Wayne T. Brooks to serve on the Board of Voter Registration for a term to expire on 12-31-1992 and take any necessary action. Appointments Committee, care to handle that one? And I think we have the gentleman here if he cares to speak. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, this is not an appointment by the Appointments Committee, and we are a nonpartisan board, but it takes me great pleasure <laughs> to um, ask that the Council consider appointing, approve appointing Peter Wayne Peter. T. Brooks to serve on the Board of Voter Registration with a term expiring 12 31 92. Is that a motion? Spirit of nonpartisanship. Right. I will second that. <laughs> I knew you wanted to do it. That's why. Been moved and seconded. Any other comment? Just, yes. just for informational purposes, the, the way it, it is now established, the Board of Voter Registration has three members. Uh, there's a Republican member who is appointed by the Chairman of the Republican Town Committee, a Democratic member by the Chairman of the Democratic Town Committee, and the clerk uh, has the authority to appoint the Chairman. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to say as an old friend of Mr. Brooks that um, he deserves another term uh, on the board. It, it seems to me every time I go to vote, he's there and pleasant and busily enrolling people. And uh, I wish him well. You know. Any other comment? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Six to nothing. Item 132, consider authorizing the sale of a fire department hose dryer and taking necessary action. I believe you have a memo here, sir, and, and I don't know how you're going to, if I throw it out to start with, I don't know how you're going to uh, advertise it and how much it's going to cost you, but I hope it doesn't cost you more than what you get for the dryer. <laughs> no, we're not going to put an ad in the newspaper. We're going to... to uh, put a little note maybe in the Cape Courier uh, through a little ad and uh, make the Portland Fire Department aware that it is available and with a very low minimum bid. If do the you, council authorizes its sale. Do you feel it's I necessary to do it bid process? Cleaner, say it. It, it is. Okay. Anybody I else got a comment? I, I move. I so move. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote, six to nothing. I will entertain a motion to skip item 133 because I believe we have an item, two items to bring up out of order, and then we'll go back to 133 because that takes us into executive session. If I'm correctly reading procedure. Does anyone care to make a motion? On um, for 134, we'll call it for the appointments. You heard a recommendation for the appointments committee earlier. 
Do you care to go through the recommendation or would you care to make a motion, Councilor Greenlaw? Mr. Chairman, I would like to move that we take item 134 out of order. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, to vote. Now what's your wishes? Mr. Chairman, I would like to move that we set to public hearing at 7.30 on March 12, 1990 in the Town Hall, proposed amendments to sections 4-4-2, 4-6-2, and 4-5-1. These would affect the length of terms of regular planning board members and conservation commission members and would increase the membership on the Board of Health from three to five members. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any other comment? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, it's a vote. And I believe we have another item. I think we, as I read this memo, that we could take up tonight is 135 out of order, if any of you people so wish. Mr. Chairman, I'll move that we take up another item out of order, item 135. Second. Any other comment? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Okay, what we have before us here as item 135, do you want to handle that or you want me to uh, do Just it? a prefix, I would like to prefix. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, the police department was involved in uh, the, some seizure of some drug, drug assets uh, back this summer. And after the sale of some of the assets, uh, they have, the U.S. Attorney's Office called the police chief today and said that we would be receiving $3,034 as our share of the drug uh, assets. Uh, under uh, this federal law, this, they must be used for law enforcement purposes. Uh, the chief indicated to me that the, the U.S. Attorney's Office wanted to have some sort of ceremony on Friday uh, turning over the checks. That's the re reason I have it on the agenda this evening is so that you can uh, authorize him to, to accept uh, that on behalf of the town in accordance with the state statute. Uh, in this memo, which, which I received tonight, the, and the chief indicated that he'd like to apply these funds toward the purchase of some new semi-automatic uh, firearms. Uh, he has discussed that with me. Uh, I'm a little reluctant to ask you to do that this evening, uh, you know, without having considered the purchase and knowing, knowing what's involved in it. And I personally don't see any reason why that couldn't be on the agenda tomorrow, uh, next month on actually how the funds would be spent. So uh, I would ask you at this point to uh, authorize the, uh, the acceptance of the funds and to request that the use of the funds be on a future town council agenda. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any other comment? Yes, Councilor Greenlaw. I have a question. Maybe Captain Tolan can answer. How many semi-automatic firearms does the department have right now? And what do you use them for? <laughs> I want to borrow one and mow down some deer. <laughs> <laughs> no comment on that. Uh, we have approximately four right now that uh, nine millimeter variety that we purchased for the tactical team that we had. We have. Mm -hmm. Over the approximately the last two years, uh, Sergeant Lindsay, Sergeant Williams, and the chief have been involved as the department range officers uh, with testing different semi-automatic weapons. As we feel that this is the weapon of the future, this is the weapon that should be carried in just about every department in the country is moving in this direction. We have settled on a particular weapon that we feel meets our needs the best, and we found it to be the best weapon on the market for the price. So we would be purchasing an automatic, one of these semi-automatic weapons for each member of the department, full-time member of the department. Thank you. Council Ambro. How much does each one cost? That I couldn't tell you exactly. Sergeant Lindsay is the uh, officer that's involved, and uh, the longer we wait, the price goes up as it is with everything. And uh, the price has gone up since we first looked at this particular brand in the uh, late fall. At the same time, we are going to trade in all the weapons that we have at this time. We have uh, each officer has a 38 caliber and a 2-inch, a small off-duty weapon, and also the 9 millimeters that we purchased for the tactical team. All these weapons would be traded in to this firm and to other firms to uh, assist us in the purchase of these weapons. Thank you. Manager has a yeah, Originally, in the chief's five-year plan, he had the replacement of these weapons budgeted at $6,000. 
so that there's still even with, with these funds would be somewhat of a gap. And there's another complicating issue in this, and that's that the Cape Elizabeth Police Patrolmen's Association at one point purchased some 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 of these guns. I, I don't understand. The uh, off-duty weapons. The off-duty weapons, and technically the association still owns those guns. And I want to have, I'd like to see that issue resolved, and I understand the association does as well, uh, as to ownership of, of those uh, firearms uh, before we move ahead and, and purchase others. So I would like to, to bring it to you as a package. Okay, anybody else? Yes, Council Amaral. Just uh, one comment. Not everything goes up the longer you wait. Some things come down. <laughs> like can, computers, like the cost of houses. I can speak to the Money fact on this. <laughs> <laughs> on this issue, uh, they are going up. Uh, we've, they, we've seen a price increase on the weapon we've selected in the last several months. Not a major price increase, but it's still going up. Council Cargishaw. Are these American made? Yes. Well, so partly. Last, last, partly. Last year, yeah. right. Anybody else? Got a comment? Uh, do I have somebody come up with a motion to? We did. We did. We moved and oh, you did? I didn't, hear, I didn't hear it, and I'm sorry. We moved in second to authorize taking 135 up out of order, but the manager's recommendation was to accept the money and not the weapons and hold it for the next meeting, and I don't remember hearing a motion for that. I must yeah. fell asleep. I moved it. I'm sorry. I fell asleep. All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, it's a vote, six to nine. Sorry I fell asleep on you. Thanks, Ed. <coughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Council Amber. Uh, I would move that we go into executive session to uh, receive an update from the town manager on collective bargaining and also to begin the annual evaluation of the town manager. Second. Been moved and seconded with one comment, but I guess there's nobody here to ask for citizen discussion, which comes after this motion, so we shall move forward. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Those opposed, six to nothing. We thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening. And I believe this, we are ready for a motion to adjourn. Oh, excuse me, sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, okay. We don't need the TV. So we don't need the TV people. You can uh, close up shop and we'll see you at a later date. And thank you. Are we gonna, where are we going to have the meeting? Here? No, this is too open. Yeah, conference room.